and welcome to another episode of Upon Further Review. I'm Josh Aubrey. Join me in just a little bit. We'll have Frank Solkowski, Sports Director from WJCL Television in Savannah. It's been a wild week or so. We had the Hurricane Irma come through. A lot of people left town. Of course, much of Savannah was evacuated. You had the Contraflow going up I-16 both ways, and then it didn't end up being quite as bad as a lot of people had thought. Mass people coming back into town. Uh, the Bullock County Schools closed Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. They're back in there on Wednesday. As for the area, what that did for our sports. Of course, Georgia Southern goes on the road to take on New Hampshire in uh, Birmingham. Ends up losing to an FCS school. First time since 94 that they've lost to a lower division school, 22 to 12. We'll get into that in just a moment. Um, we'll also hear from head coach of the Georgia Southern Eagles, Tyson Summers. As for the high school scene, Statesboro was supposed to play, play Scraven County, a much anticipated game. That game was canceled. They will not make it up. And as for the Southeast Blue Yellow Jackets, well, they did move their game with Benedictine to Thursday night. We're able to get that in. Unfortunately, they come out on the lopsided score. In that one, Bullock Academy goes to Thomas Jefferson, picks up a big win for them. Um, and Portal Jenkins County ended up being uh, canceled as well. But we're going to get in here from Frank Solkowski in just a moment, and we'll get into some high school and Georgia Southern. But before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone for any legal advice you may have in the Statesboro Bullock County area, talk to our friend Lovett Bennett Jr., attorney at law located in downtown Statesboro. Give Lovett a call if you need any legal advice. And join me now, the big guy, Frank Solkowski from WJCL Television in Savannah. Frank's been doing double duty this week. Unfortunately, the Eagles having to hit the road for Birmingham. Frank hits the road with them. The road, unfortunately, hit back. And then Frank gets to come back home and relax and lounge around. No, he doesn't. He gets right into hurricane preparedness and gets out there. And I saw a boat that was displaced. Uh, how was the hurricane coverage, first of all, Frank? Well, I tell you what, uh, you know, it's never fun to cover uh, severe storms and hurricanes and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, when duty calls, you have to do it. And, and, you know, it really puts things in perspective. You know, you, you come back from uh, Birmingham, where, where Georgia Southern had a, a really embarrassing loss and everybody really talking about that. And then you get back and you have a storm like Hurricane Irma and then it turns into a tropical storm and so many concerns about that. And you see uh, property and folks' lives. Those are the things that are on the line. It really puts stuff into perspective. Uh, so I had a chance to, to get out and I was down in McIntosh County for a little bit, then out on Tybee. And, uh, you know, there's a good bit of damage, but it could have been a lot worse. And again, uh, just thankful so many folks uh, were able to evacuate and now starting to get back to their homes. Uh, but it, it's definitely unusual, you know, being there to try to tell the story when you have these uh, serious weather things happening. Uh, but I am ready to get back to sports, that's for sure. Let's get into the thing that Frank knows a little bit more about as opposed to wind gusts and things like that. And that is the Georgia Southern Eagles who tried to get away from the hurricane and maybe thought, hey, we'll go to Birmingham. We'll get this game in. Maybe we can get one step closer to the six wins we need for bowl eligibility. And I think we were all a little bit shocked by what turned out there in Birmingham where Georgia Southern goes down 22 to nothing at the half. Fights back a little bit. The defense played well in the second half, but the offense still didn't score until the fourth quarter, and they lose by 10 to an FCS school. We've mentioned the first time since 94 that they've started 0-2, the first time since 94 that they've uh, lost to a team in a lower division. Things aren't looking real good for the Eagles right now. No, and then on top of that, you know, you really want your team to try to shake that off and get back to work and, and maybe get to the next game where you can hopefully bounce back. And then the Eagles get an off week before they go on the road to take on what's going to be a very tough Indiana Hoosier squad up in Bloomington. I mean, that's going to be their first ever meeting. And you're talking about a squad that was toe for toe and battling Ohio State in the season opener just a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, things aren't going to get any easier for the Eagles staring down 0-2. Uh, of course, many expected the Auburn game to, to, to be a loss for Georgia Southern. 
other. And I don't think anyone expected. I think some people were a little cautious that you got a New Hampshire squad that is one of the uh, top 15 teams in the FCS that they would put up a fight and be a little bit of a challenge. But I don't think too many people envisioned New Hampshire and Georgia Southern to play in Birmingham and Georgia Southern to fall into a 22-0 halftime hole and then lose the game by 10 again to an FCS team. It was definitely one of the more embarrassing losses the Eagles have, maybe not as far as the differential in the score, but for a team that you're supposed to beat, uh, Georgia Southern really didn't show much fight over in Birmingham for sure. Well, Frank, you mentioned that the bye week comes at a bad time. I mean, I might I disagree and say I think it comes at a good time because you've got to almost go back to the drawing board after your offense didn't score for seven quarters and a seven and a half really and then only scored once uh, against an FCS team things do not look good on the offensive side of the board in particular and I would think you almost have to overall something and at least if you've got an extra week Maybe you have an extra week to experiment. And to be honest, I mean, you really have two and a half weeks before you're playing a game that you've really got to win. And that's the conference opener, which is coming up in a couple weeks on a Wednesday. I think you're expected to lose the Indiana game. If you throw some things out there to see if it works, then, you know, who? I mean, you want to be competitive and you want to win. But really, I think you've got a couple weeks to experiment with something because something's got to change. It is not looking much better than it did last year. Well, and, and then here's the problem with that. You know, you had all spring and all summer to implement your offense. And now you've played seven and a half quarters before getting a touchdown. So you've had plenty of time to implement that offense. And it still has mustered, uh, you know, seven points. Let's go ahead and say ten points through the first two games. We did get a field goal against uh, New Hampshire as well. So, uh, you know, that's just the thing. I, are you going to strike it out and start over from scratch and try to get that in in a week and a half, pretty much, by the time you put all the travel and everything else in? That's a tall task. All I think you can do is make small little, uh, you know, touches and, and do a, little, a few little things different uh, to add to what you already have in the hopes that things click a little bit more. Uh, again, now that you drop that game to, uh, to New Hampshire, uh, again, each game is of the utmost importance if you want to get to that magical number of six for bowl eligibility. Uh, so, you know, there were some people going into the season that Indiana looked like a game that was going to be winnable. However, now it doesn't look so much. And like you said, and I totally agree. Uh, now you got to circle that Arkansas State game because now you have to win out, you know. And, and again, it's not so far-fetched. Just last year, remember, that same Arkansas State team opened up 0-4. They, too, lost to an FCS opponent. And then they get hot, of course. Uh, part of it was against Georgia Southern, the last second win up there in Jonesboro. So Georgia Southern has got to have a season like Arkansas State last year, and that's catch fire once you get into conference play. And as you know, Arkansas State went on and, and competed for uh, the top spot in the Sun Belt and went to a bowl game and looked very good. That's what Georgia Southern has got to be hoping for and praying for now as we uh, get into the latter part of September. Well, I guess I'm not saying you scrap the offense and start all over, but you've got to do some, I think, some fairly major overalls, overhauls. And if that means maybe you work a little more under center, maybe you work a little bit more under center. If that means you maybe throw LeBaron Anthony or Cato in there at quarterback just to see what they've got, maybe you do that. And I'm not putting it all on shy words because – you know, the offensive line still seems like they're struggling a bit. You know, the, we, we know Wesley Fields is a good running back. We know L.A. Ramsby is a good running back. We don't really know that much about the rest. They seem like they were pretty good in the preseason. They seem like they were pretty good in the scrimmages. But do you think you try another quarterback back there? Do you think maybe you try to maybe go under center? I, I don't know. I, I think I'm reaching for, for, for some things just like the coaching staff might be. You know, to, to me, what I've seen so far in the first two games, and, and I know the X's and O's really getting it done, not getting it done, what I haven't seen is that spark, uh, that swagger that maybe you saw out of like a Kevin Ellison. I think that's what's really missing. I don't think these guys have a strut, have an attitude, have 
have that, I hate using the cliche swagger, uh, but it just doesn't seem that. It just seems like they're very, let's go play a football game. And, and again, Kevin Ellison for some, some said, you know, he showboated a little bit too much or was too vocal or anything else. I think that's part of the swagger that, that's missing from the Georgia Southern, especially on the uh, the offensive side of the ball. And again, again, like you said, it's not all in shy words. He's a, he's a redshirt freshman quarterback uh, getting his first playing. Uh, somebody else has got to step up and, and lead this team and, and, and have that swagger. And I just think maybe that swagger will come with some success. And since the Eagles haven't seen much success in the first two games, that swagger is still dormant. So I'm waiting to see what it is. And I, and I think, you know, I think Georgia Southern, like you said, will tinker with some things here and there and try to get some new looks. I think uh, Miles Campbell really hasn't been utilized to the fullest in the first two games of the season. So hopefully we'll start seeing this stuff start playing out because at this point, uh, you got to let it hang out. You, you, you know, you just lost to a team that was pretty much chalked up a win. I hate saying that, uh, but a New Hampshire game when it's on the schedule, that was figured to be your one. You were paying them $300,000 to play while you paid them to hand you your second loss of the season. So now you got to go out and, and beat somebody that was maybe uh, on the fence or somebody you weren't expected to beat. And that's just the way you got to look at it. So again, maybe let it hang out. I thought, you know, the first half, the entire team was flat. I think everything was flat. Part of that, I think, was of the location and the moving from the storm. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, you're playing football. It's something you do every day, and it's the season. If you can't get up for that, no matter where you're playing, there are some serious issues. All right. Well, stay with us. We just heard from me and Frank. Uh, now we'll hear from Coach Summers after the game as he tried to look for answers from what happened in their 22-12 to loss to New Hampshire. Hill and Johnston Insurers. We've been Statesboro's insurance people since 1963. That's a lot of memories. Recognized as one of the leading agencies in Georgia, Lee Hill and Johnston is independent and offers a complete line of personal and business insurance for auto, life, home, and health. We'll shop companies to find the lowest premiums and best coverage for you, your family, or your business. Lee Hill and Johnston Insurers, the insurance people since 1963. All right, you heard from me and Frank. Now it's time to hear from Georgia Southern head coach Tyson Summers on the New Hampshire game. As far as football game goes, uh, I'm upset as I can be. I'm frustrated as I can be. Um, just uh, uh, and, and don't, not at being able to execute the way we need to. We don't get ourselves out to a start uh, in the first half the way we need to, you know, uh, drive the ball down the first series and have a, a really costly turnover something in the series that you felt like you should have been able to come away with, uh, you know, a touchdown, at least a field goal, uh, wind up being able to, to, to not get off the field on third down through the other series of it. It's 14 point swing, uh, you know, right there in the beginning where we should have been able to be up at least seven to nothing. Uh, again, first half, not being able to battle back and uh, give ourselves a chance, uh, not being able to get any points on the board offensively and how frustrating that is. Uh, from a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, you know, lost, uh, again, mentioned it earlier, but lost a turnover battle, two big drives where we, where we wind up making, you know, just poor decisions, poor decisions with the ball. And uh, doesn't give ourselves really a chance uh, to do it, you know, and uh, I'm just upset, frustrated as I can be. A lot of things we got to go back to work at, a lot of things we've got to go look at as a coaching staff, look ourselves in the eye and see if we're doing the right things or not. Um, and that's a big part of as we move into the next uh, week or two. We've got an open week here, and uh, we'll try to take a look at those things and see what we can do. Uh, defensively, again, uh, you know, we wind up winning uh, a lot of different things from the statistical category, but that's, uh, you know, that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we lost the game 22 to 12. Uh, we had our opportunities to get back into it in the second half. We weren't able to take advantage of all of those opportunities as they came. And, uh, and, and, you know, wound up getting beat. Felt like in the first half we were beating ourselves. So, uh, you know, positives to take away from it. Uh, Logan Hunt, I thought Logan played well. Logan had two sacks, three TFLs. I thought Mark Rashad was able to catch a couple big passes for us and do something with the ball once he caught it. Uh, I do believe that Shy continues to battle. He had some high numbers from a statistical standpoint tonight. And, 
we've got to come back and go to work. And we've got to, again, all of us, players, coaches, uh, same thing I told them, it is going to be tough. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to have to be able to look at some of the things, again, that we're doing to give ourselves a chance. Coach, do you feel like there's major overalls, overhauls that need to be done on offense? Uh, you know, we've got to be able to score points, and we ain't done that. Uh, so we're going to have to take a look and see what all those things are. You know, we tried to be able to make some adjustments to some things, whether it's tempo, motion, uh, a lot of different things going into this game while still staying in what we were trying to do from a base standpoint and, uh, and try to be able to give them some different looks and trying to be able to throw the ball with a little bit more efficiency at times. And uh, so we'll have to take a look. That's a decision we're going to have to make once we get in there, you know, tonight and get back after we've graded the film and, uh, and try to make sure that there's obviously going to be some kind of over, overall, yes. You guys were pretty high on the running backs, obviously. You had two returning guys that you thought a lot of. You also had an offensive line that you guys talked quite highly about mm -hmm. how well they've done. Can you put your finger on what's going on on the offense, why they're not being able to move the ball? Well, you know, a lot of it, again, like tonight, we sit there and we've got plenty of yards, but we don't come away with any points. Uh, we put ourselves in some bad positions. Uh, the, the third down scenario is not terrible tonight. Like it, it really was last week, but we've got to be able to do those things, you know. And uh, and at the end of the day, that's that's all it becomes about. It's how do you score points? And we haven't done that, um, you know. And I'm as frustrated and upset as I can possibly be. And uh, yeah, there's some different reasons that we feel like those things are getting created. And we've got to, that's our job as coaches to be able to look at it and be able to make some adjustments. Uh, how big or how small, you know, I wouldn't want to say right now. We'll have to do that when we get in there and look at all of it tonight and in our staff meeting. First time Georgia Southern's been 0 and 2 since '94. First time they've lost to a lower division school since '94. Mm -hmm. What do you tell the fans or the people who are like so frustrated, like you are right now, mm -hmm. to keep them keep hoping alive? Well, uh, again, our fan base got more than a right to be frustrated. They do, uh, you know, and, and I promise you, I don't want to continue to go through it. I mean, uh, as we go through right now. Our fan base being upset is certainly something I understand. And it's certainly something that I got to continue to combat and continue to be able to try to do a good job within our locker room and making sure that those guys understand in the locker room uh, how much we still care about them. But we got to keep getting better and we got to go to work. Like I told our, our team today, uh, whenever we finished up, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for us to get this thing finished up the way we want it to be. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to practice. Uh, and it's going to be hard in the community. It's going to be hard in a lot of different places. And if we can, if we can dig down deep and we can continue to make sure we understand how much where we're trying to get to and continue down that path, we got a chance to be successful. If we don't, it's going to be even harder. And stay with us. Coming up next, Frank Solkowski joins us once again to talk a little about our area high school football. No Credit Refused isn't just an offer, it's a way of business and has been for over 100 years. No banks, no ridiculous credit requirements, just local Badcock store owners who treat you right and give you credit when others won't. It's never been easier to express your style and love your home. All right, joining me now, once again, the big guy, Frank Solkowski from WJCL Television in Savannah. I know, Frank, you had to leave on Friday to head up to Birmingham to over to Birmingham to get ready for the Georgia Southern uh, New Hampshire game But there weren't many games on Friday a lot of teams moved them to Thursday a lot of games were canceled it Seems like much of this is deja vu from last year and now once again You've got a lot of games Canceling moving coming up this week. Let's focus on a couple of the area teams that were in action We had Bullock Academy go on the road to Thomas Jefferson will Aaron did uh, very good. I'm um, Don Aaron rather at quarterback did very well had three touchdowns and they beat Thomas Jefferson who was under or Hadn't won a game yet this year. They beat them pretty handily Meanwhile on Thursday night Southeast Bullock welcomes in Benedictine. I don't think it would have mattered if they played that game Thursday Friday whenever Southeast Bullock was gonna have their hands full they came out of the gates you know, they, they, I know you've, you've mentioned to me before, Benedictine's a bit of a slow starter. Six to nothing, Southeast Bullock misses a field goal that could have maybe cut the lead in half. And then Benedictine's, the machine begins there in the second quarter. And I see them in the third and the fourth. And 
Wow, they're a lot of fun to watch if you're not pulling for the team or covering the team they're playing. Um, you've had to have been spoiled the past few years. We know their head coach uh, was a former Georgia Southern player. And, you know, it, it's kind of fun to watch that offense. They work under center. They work out of the shotgun. They throw the ball. They run the ball. They do everything pretty well. I would be shocked if they don't make a big run again this year. Well, you're talking about a, a program, and I'm not going to say Benedictine's a good team. They are most definitely a good program, one of the best in the entire state. I mean, they've won two of the past three state championships in double A, and they're one of the teams that they just reload. I mean, they had so many guys. Uh, you know, you go a couple years back, you take a guy like, uh, you know, you take some of the guys that, that we've seen over the years that go off to Division One. Brad Stewart a couple years ago. Uh, last year, uh, John Wesley Kennedy, who's now over at uh, Georgia Southern. Uh, this year, you're starting to see the other guys emerge. Travis Blackshear, even a young guy, Rico Powers, who's just a sophomore, a very impressive athlete already uh, for Benedictine. Uh, of course, you got Nick Iannone, who's the senior quarterback who led them to the state championship last year, and you touched on it. Danny Britt, their head coach, a former Georgia Southern Eagle, and he's a defensive guru, and, and you get a chance to see that when you start playing these local teams where Benedictine just seems to you know play a little close at first again they are a little slow starting but once they get started once that ball starts to roll look out Benedictine is one of the best teams all classifications here in the state of Georgia all right let's get to a game coming up this week the only one for our area teams all the other teams are the southeast book was supposed to play islands they're making that up i believe in two weeks because they're both on a bye that same week it works out well so they're going to move that game portal and uh, ba both have bye weeks that were already scheduled and statesboro was supposed to play effingham on friday at effingham that game has been moved to saturday to give those guys at least a day to practice they haven't practiced since this past thursday so i think it works out well for both of those guys to be able to play on friday Tell us a little bit about what Statesboro can expect playing Effingham. Well, of course, Effingham, early in their season, they started out winless, uh, but they did have a couple tough games. Uh, they faced Coffee in the Irk Russell Classic. They opened the season there over at Paulson Stadium. They followed that up with a, with a loss to Thompson, and you guys know uh, all about the Thompson Bulldogs, a very good program there. Uh, uh, they lost a close game there. However, Effingham got back onto their winning ways, and they did it against their rival South Effingham in a big way uh, last week. In one of those games that was moved to Thursday, uh, due to the hurricane, and I tell you what, uh, Effingham looks strong, really, really strong. And I, I tell you what, what you're going to have to watch out for are, are the are the Gant brothers. I mean, those two guys. Uh, you got Demario Gant, who's the wide receiver. He had a couple touchdowns in that game receiving for Effingham, and then Zabrandon Gant, uh, the big running back, it looked really impressive. Actually, hauled in Player of the Week honors, had about 300 yards and a rushing and a couple touchdowns against South Effingham. Those guys are good. That when their offense gets going, uh, they can uh, they can hang with just about anybody there at Effingham. Uh, the Effingham defense, you can score on them. That's just it. They're a little suspect there, a little bit on defense because so many of the playmakers are spending their time over on the offensive side of the ball. And, of course, uh, there's been a change defensively. Uh, former Jenkins High head coach Tim Adams is a new uh, defensive coordinator. His first year out there at Effingham, former Georgia Southern standout, former uh, you know uh, Effingham defensive coordinator Mikey Ward is now over in Wayne County. So the defense going through a little change in uh, defensive leadership but again Effingham a very quality opponent and and from what I've seen against Statesboro uh, and from Statesboro this could be one of those offensive games like uh, like 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 folks like to see there could be a lot of scoring between Effingham and Statesboro very similar to that Liberty County game that the Blue Devils had a couple weeks ago all right well Frank we appreciate your insight as always the Eagles with their bye week this week a fairly light schedule for you are you having a blitz on Friday we are still set to do our high school football frenzy on Friday night at WJCL News at 11. It is going to be a little slim pickings. There's a lot of, like you said, a lot of the games moving to Saturday uh, or just being rescheduled altogether. We do have some games. Actually, we talked about Benedictine. They are set to play at Swainsboro on Friday night. 
That should be an interesting one. Then you go over to South Carolina, which will be our featured game this Friday night, is Hilton Head against Bluffton. Of course, those two rivals, they call that the Battle of the Bridge because of that bridge that separates them. That game's on for Friday as well. And there are some other games. We're expecting Wayne County at Appling County and a couple others of the more inland uh, areas. So we will be out and about. Cameras will once again be rolling. Uh, we're going to dry off for a couple days and give it a go on Friday night. All right. Don't forget the frenzy coming about 11, 15, 11, somewhere between 10 after and quarter after the frenzy starts. Right, Frank? That's it. I just say, you know what? Go ahead and tune in at 11 and then you can't miss it. All right. Frank Slokowski joining us. We'll be back with more in just a moment. The Medical Center Pharmacy on Grenade Street is proud to be your Health Mart Pharmacy in Statesboro. The Medical Center Pharmacy, locally owned and serving this community for 50 years, is open 364 days a year. The pharmacists at Medical Center know there's nothing more important than your family's well-being. That's why they take the time to know their customers, explain their medications, and answer any questions. The Medical Center Pharmacy, your Health Mart Pharmacy. Health Mart, caring for you and about you. To stay ahead, a parent has to really be on the go. And stop for school, stop for sports, stop for an intervention. But you don't have to stop for banking. To stay ahead with mobile online banking, bank ahead with Queensboro National Bank and Trust. See Jeremy Reagan and the staff at Queensboro National Bank and Trust, South Main Street in Statesboro. Well, you've heard from me and Frank. Now let's get back to this past Thursday night and take a look at some of the highlights or some of the game from Southeast Bullock and Benedictine. Southeast Bullock Yellow Jackets still looking for their first win of the season. A tall task at hand, hosting undefeated Benedictine. The defense holds the high-powered cadet offense on their initial drive of the game, stopping them on fourth down. But on their next drive, the give to Tarek Smalls. He's in for the touchdown. Extra point fails, 6 nothing cadets. That score would hold till early in the second. Travis Blackshear from eight yards out to make it 13 to nothing. The Jacket offense finally puts a drive together behind who else? Chase Walker. This would lead to an Evan Heidler field goal attempt. A long one, a little short and a little right. Still 13 nothing. The cadet passing game then in effect. Nick Iannone to Blackshear for the score to make it 20 to nothing just before the half. Ian Own to Rico Powers and it's 27 to nothing at the half. Second half, Ian Own to Powers who slips a tackle and gets all the way down inside the five yard line. Cleaning things is up from there. It's Blackshear with his third score of the game to make it 34 to nothing. The Jacket offense then with a nice drive, Blaze Minnick to Tyler Thornton for the first down. Jaleel Hodge then gets ahead for a nice eight-yard pickup. Next to give to John Trail Wells ahead for a first down. Can't leave out Chase Walker, and here he nearly breaks free, but this one's still good for a 15 yards and a first down. Later, fourth and two. Blaze Minnick will go airborne to get the first down, but not the touchdown. But then, from the one, it's Walker fighting in for the score. The shutout stopped at 34-7, but BC not done yet. Check out this run from Blackshear in the open field with a nice spin move to get free inside the 10-yard line. And then from there, the give will go to Powers, who fights outside for the touchdown. And Benedictine wins this one by a final of 48-7. to And that'll wrap things up for this week's show. I'd like to thank Frank Sokowski for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Later on in the week, we'll hear from Jennifer Hurst, as she'll be back to give us her picks.